two missing now, but there, there hopefully there will be just one missing. Uh, me, of course, Captain Ron and uh, Dieter Stouting here up in Toronto. Hey, Dieter. Hey, and, uh, Eric Larson. And uh, whoops, one. Second. Yeah. Eric, and, uh, Eric Kirk is, <laughs> is in and out. He has, uh, he's, we don't want you to take it personally. He has some personal things going with his wife's health and uh, he's beer by here. He's not beer. He's here by extraordinary circumstances and he may be leaving us. He's talking on the phone to her. It's a little deal came up with, with uh, his wife, Deb. And then our trusty flight attendant, Diane, is off uh, actually working in disguise, actually working. <laughs> Yeah. And I think she is actually in the air at this point in time, wow. so she couldn't even join us from her hotel room. So anyway, but welcome. We're all uh, we're glad to be here, and we're glad you're here. And uh, tonight we got a I think we got another good show for you. The first thing we like to do is remind you if you have not joined our Fearless Flight Birds of a Feather group, please consider doing that at at uh, your earliest possibility. Uh, it's a it's a place where you can go for information and support, and you can also lend the same to other people. Um, let's see for tonight's show. We're gonna Actually, we're gonna yeah. we're go gonna ahead. continue our. Oh, I know what I know what I'm missing. I'm missing the monitoring thing. That's why. No, I'm not. Well, I want to say hi to Hey Elaine. I want to say hi to Jim Salvador. Hey Salvador. Oh my God, it's been a long time, Oliver. Hey, yeah, you know what? Up here in Canada, it's cold. It's we're under a polar vortex, but um, I love being outside. And yes, Elaine. It is a really great group. <laughs> hey, Salvador was supposed to fly, I believe, over the holidays. I yeah, think. I think so. I think so. Yeah, Salvador. And if you if you did, Salvador, and you would like to come on, uh, either either put put some questions in. This is for everyone tonight. We're gonna we're we're trying to push more for questions. This is this is not about us and listening to ourselves talk. This is about you. And we really want, we, we ideally, we want to treat this like a podcast. We want you all to participate. And, uh, and if you would, and you want to call me, um, 602-315-4602, or put your, put your question in the, the remarks there, because that's really how everybody grows. And that's how you find out and get feedback that you're not the only one here. So we want to do that. And, and Salvador, particularly if you got, if you got any feedback, because I know we talked before the end of the year, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, to come on and, and share your experience with us. So, okay, so we're oh, going to continue. I got a question for you there, Ron. Okay. I like it. I like it, Oliver. I'm not sure if it's going to happen in the summer, but he's asking, how is it looking for a class in Burbank uh, this summer? That was, um, you that know, was it, it really depends. I've been talking more to other people about that. As a matter of fact, I called the, the, um, the owner of the studio there and I don't know. I didn't, I got a, a voicemail that was strange. So I don't know how he's doing. Cause I know this was, this was devastating to him because the movie industry virtually shut down. Yeah. So, uh, but, but right now we're working locally to, and, and I'm guessing that by the summer, we're going to have some changes in the, in the culture in terms of the, the, the vaccinations, the number of people vaccinated and, and get closer to where. I think, I think, I um, think, we had talked about it on a show, yeah. actually, Eric, yeah. Diane, and I, um, I. We were moderately confident that October, November um, mm -hmm. may actually be the time where that could happen. Yeah. So um, as soon as we know more from Talat and uh, all of those of you, Elaine, um, who've been at Air Hollywood, um, you know that this is a one-of-a-kind experience being yeah. Yeah. a real life movie studio that allows for that full sensory experience and um, so real that in fact some people Captain Ron think that they're in the air while they're sitting inside a warehouse yeah and, it's, and really, it's really we've good. played up we played up the resources over there because they are phenomenal but we've also we're also working as you may know on the, uh, an online 201 class, which we used to do on the same day that we did the 301 took the actual flight, but that makes the day kind of cramped. So we're, what we're actually trying to do, and we need your help to get the word out. 
So anybody you know that has a fear of flying, particularly in in in, in your area, uh, pass help us get the word out because because we're we're looking not only to return to LA, but we'd like to also reach to do Boston, Susan. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that, that's probably our next. We're Susan probably going to go coast to coast, and that's probably going to be our our first non LA uh, class that we do. So, so if Ron, you can, we got a question here coming in from, hey, go from ahead. Jim. Um, he, his question is: I listen to the ATC a lot. Most of the time, planes take off and land in PSP on thirty one L, but sometimes they switch to thirty thirteen R. I know Phoenix changes the direction of arrivals and departure also. What factors determine which runway are, you know, is being used in a particular- um, Okay, and, and they had 13 left and right? They had, um, actually the numbers that he's mentioning is 31L left. Okay, where, and where, where's it at? 13 you know right, and that's you know a um, PSP. So you tell me what that Palm is. Palm Springs, okay. Palm Springs. Yeah, oh, great question. Great question. Okay, so uh, I don't have my, my graphics hooked up. So imagine the runway going from top to bottom, okay? And, and top, let's say, is north, okay? And bottom is south. If you take a compass rose and put it over the runway, the, the uh, cardinal heading would be Three six zero, okay. We don't use zero degrees. We use three six when it comes because zero, I don't know. It's a convention they use. Okay. So if we're using runway three six, that means we're landing on a runway that's going into the wind, and the winds are out of the out of the north. So and the and the cardinal heading represent. If you reverse that, one hundred eighty degrees, and you land the other way, it's runway. Uh, um, well, they, they had one, three and three, one. So it would be runway one, eight. Okay. So three, one would be a runway that's taking off to the Northwest and runway one, three would be a, a, a runway that's taking off to the Southeast. So the runways are labeled according to the Cardinal compass rows and, and the nearest one. And they, they realign those every, every year. Or so they, they, because the earth's magnetic field is shifting. So Let's say that this particular runway 31 that this person was talking about in Palm Springs, it, it, it maybe the actual true magnetic heading is like uh, 308. They're going to round it up to 31 because they're not going to put 30.8 or anything like that in there. Okay. So we always take off into the wind. So if, if we're using runway 31, that means we're going to be at the, the far end and we're going to take off to the northwest because the winds are coming generally out of that quadrant. If the winds were to switch around and we're gonna land into the wind, which we, same thing, we're gonna land on runway one three, okay? So that's all, all right. there is to know about runways. Okay, do you wanna, um, oh, we got we got something funny. I'll, I'll let you. Um, okay. Yeah, we, 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 in uh, Diane is always, uh, she's kind of like our, our person who looks for cartoons and things like that. And, uh, and so she came up with this, I don't know, are we sharing the screen again? Yeah, we are. So, okay. and she would say she doesn't look, oh, yeah, for it. It. They just, okay. that those yeah. things just find her. Yeah. So this, so, so this, and, and, and she was, her, her wit was right with her. It says, so here's a uh, pearls before swine. I know that's one of her favorite cartoons. So, so we got one of the main characters. He says, wise ass on the hill. So he's looking to talk to the guru. Oh, wise ass on the hill. Tell us all when, when things get better when you decide they get better, what does that mean? That you can't control events, but you can control your reaction to your, those events. I was hoping he'd just say Tuesday. And isn't that the truth with all of us? We'd really like to control the, the turbulence. We'd like to control the pilots, their behavior, make sure they're, they're smart, ship shape and, and seaman like when they come to work and all those things that are out of our control. And really a lot in life is out of our control. But you can't, you can't do that. All we can do is, is control our reaction or our, hopefully our response and to, to events in the world. So that was a, a, a well-targeted uh, cartoon there. So, okay. Uh, so tonight we're gonna resume, we're gonna continue our review uh, of how to overcome your fear of flying. And this week we're looking at chapter three, which is called Triggers. And 
going to scroll down to my notes. So in chapter one, we, we learned that our mind has a mind of its own. In chapter two, we learned about the force that drives the mind and our thinking. In chapter three, we're going to learn to recognize what activates your amygdala or your fear center, uh, which we affectionately refer to as triggers. So those things that activate the amygdala are called triggers. All right. I'm, I'm moving. No, nope, I can't do that. All right. And uh, knowing what trips your trigger uh, can, can help you uh, gain insight and understand what direction you need to go when you, if you want to learn to overcome your fear of flying. And that's what coaching is all about, is I help people find the triggers. Then we look for the related stories that, that uh, they tell themselves uh, related to those triggers. And then we look for, our, for skills and strategies and tools that we can use to, uh, to change that. This is one of our famous quotes. The pain in your brain is not about the plane. No matter how much we want to blame all of our misery on, on the airplane, on air traffic control, on, on the, the turbulence, the bumps and all that, it has nothing to do with that. It's all up here. And it goes back to Diane's cartoon. It depends upon our reaction to, to the, uh, the stimulus uh, rather than, than uh, the, the stimulus itself. Okay. Uh, if we, we talked about in chapter two, if the amygdala is the smoke detector of our brain, then triggers are the smoke that activates our alarms. So triggers activate your fear center and trigger your inner voice. And that's what causes all the misery. It's what you say to yourself that really makes your fear of flying problematic. And it's all part of your autonomic nervous system. We have no control over that. Again, back to the cartoon. You can't control it, it, it but you, in order to keep it from controlling you, you have to come up with, with strategies and skills uh, and techniques to prevent that. Okay, uh, two types of triggers. There's mechanical, and th these are the result of, I like to say, tangible aspects of flying that could lead to crashing and dying. They tend to originate in the prefrontal cortex. So you have a thought and then the amygdala picks up on that. It's, it's got like radar feelers out there. And, and that thought then turns into a story basically that you tell yourself and then you're, you get triggered. The emotional uh, triggers on the other hand are soft or more intangible uh, fears like feeling trapped. And you can see in the slide on the left and the right there, there's a number of examples uh, and, and these are right out of the book. So, so these soft uh, or emotional triggers often originate automatically in the amygdala. So, so you don't need to have a thought about that. You have a thought or I, I mean, you, you, the amygdala gets triggered. And we talked, touched on last week that sometimes that's due to innate fears we have. We don't like snakes. We're born with a fear of snakes. Nobody has to tell us, uh, don't mess around with snakes. We're automatically uh, um, self-protective about those. Uh, we're, we're afraid of heights. We don't like the, th it's really falling that we're afraid of, but heights may represent the, the, the perception that we could fall. Loud noises, uh, those are all, these are all emotional or soft triggers. And fearful flyers usually possess both of these. It's not like we have one or the other, although do, what I've seen in the last 32 years, people have, a pre have a, I'll say a preference for one over the other, one that seems to bother them more, uh, but they both come together and result in fear, anxiety, and worry, and feel feelings of dread. They, basically, that's what makes fear of flying, why fear of flying sucks, okay? Um, our brain is wired for survival and, and it therefore notices negative things more than positive things. So we like to say uh, we're, we have a negative bias. Your boss tells you three good things about your performance during a performance review and one negative thing. And what's, what's the one that you go leave the, the, the review with? The negative one, right? You, you can't get over that. And, you know, it's, I, I remember growing up, you know, it's, you get all A's and one B. What do they notice? They notice the one B. They don't, they don't say, way, well, hey, great job. You got all A's. So, so we have a, a negative bias. And I, in fear of flying, there could be, there could be 10 articles in, in the newspaper, current every, newspaper or my news feed on my cell phone or whatever, and one negative one that may not even be directly related to flying, but it have something to do with it, like a mechanic taxi in an airplane into a jetway or something like that, and we'll pick up on the one negative. 
and will will completely disregard the, the the ten. That's why when I tell you the odds of dying in an airplane crash in a tier one air, airline are one in thirty three point two million, you say yeah, but I'll be the one. You don't think about the thirty three point two. You think about the one. So so these are all things that that the, the way the mind works that we're confronted with. This is something new that I haven't remembered. Matter of fact, I, this isn't the book. I'm supplementing the, the, the book with this neuroplasticity. And what it means is is it's good news that that we now know through, through neuroscience and neuropsychology and neuro research that you can actually change your brain symbolized by this slide here with the, with a cute little brain doing a workout. And, and that's basically what we help people do in fearless flight is we, we help you find your triggers. We help you identify the stories that go along with that and then come up with activities and exercises and, and strategies, skills, and techniques that you can, exercise your brain to literally change the way you think about flying. And one of the things that goes along with neuroplasticity, which I think is really important, is, is neuroplasticity is the ability to change your brain. And, and that's that next slide. Um, and, and if you look at this, they kind of reproduce the, the, the uh, theme of, of working out there or exercising. And they, they highlight before your experience, uh, what the phenomena looks like and then after the experience. So there's, there's, there's chemical changes that literally go on in your neurons. It's, it's all about learning to think differently. And it has to do with neuron changing the neuron pathways in our brains. And that's, and, and we've often known that, that you know, if, if I'm improving my golf swing, for example, you know, we associate that with more of a, of a tangible activity because I'm practicing my swing and I'm working on muscle memory and all that. We don't, we haven't thought as much about the fact that, that just changing my beliefs or my attitudes, we're doing the same thing, but it takes place more inside than outside. So there's not as much visible, about it. but the process is exactly the same. We are changing neuron pathways. It, and when you change the way the, the neuron pathways and, 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 and things that you know and don't know about fear of flying, you literally are teaching yourself how to think and, and change the way you think. So hey, Ron. Structural change. yeah, go ahead. I can't start my video back up because Dieter has it, but I'm back for 15. Okay, cool. Right on. Perfect. So we'll we'll bring you in after after the segment is over and we'll talk about the um the uh news that came in regard to the NTSB and the Kobe crash. Okay. Okay. All right. And so this slide just says, you know, just reinforce the fact that the brain isn't as unchangeable and fixed as as we once assumed. I mean, and that's changed throughout the body. We know that the heart can actually remanufacture tissue and and that's what um Oh, the uh, all the controversy over uh, uh, why even think about bringing up Ron the, the the tissue that they that they used to harvest anyway about using that to to culture uh, generic type cell structure and then implant it in in different areas of the body so so this is really good news for fearful flyers you can change the way you think. Uh, what I'd like to do now, if if we if you haven't, we we would I'd like to invite you to take a look at this list or or put in make a, leave us a, a remark a comment in the in the, on Facebook of, as to what your triggers are. We'll just just kind of take a running survey of some of the triggers here. And if anybody has a question about either the presentation here, anything that I've gone over, or about triggers or anything in particular related to tonight's presentation, please don't hesitate. Put it in there. Even if, and if you're looking at the replay of this, still leave it for us because we go through this and that's how we decide what the content needs to be when we talk with, with you all on that. So, so what are your triggers? And you can take a look here. Some people, they start with simply booking the flight or even before that, thinking about booking a flight. And in the book, we have them organized by virtue of pre-flight, when you get to the airport, in-flight, and then post-flight, and and so we've we've kind of organized them in a more chronological thing. One of the one of the the tools or the components in the Fearless Flight Kit is called our Fearless Flight Guide, and that has a chronological order, and it it actually deals with the triggers uh, that uh, people encounter in a chronological way, so, uh, the, the various sights, sounds, and sensations that you'll experience in a normal flight. So here's the key takeaways from from chapter three. Uh, a trigger is an event 
which sets your anxiety in motion. So it's, it's whatever it is that causes your amygdala to activate. It could be a thought about something related to flying, or it could be something that triggers your emotions. And I've found in the last 32 years that there's been an increasing proportion of people that are more bothered by emotional triggers, that is either either worried about the door closing, things like that, and feeling trapped, or worried about their own reaction to that, losing control emotionally. So, so, so no matter what the trigger is, though, it always ends up being activated by the amygdala and starting the biology. Remember, it's all about biology once you get triggered. So, so going back to, to Diane's cartoon, you can't control uh, the event, but you can't control your reaction to the event. They're activated when you don't feel safe, pure and simple. Uh, the, we're hardwired with a negativity bias. So, so, so there can be 50 things positive and one negative. We're going we're gonna to be cued into the one that's negative because that's the way we learned how to survive or our ancestors did and bring us to this point in our history. Uh, and, and no matter what, they, what the trigger is, what happens is it, it starts a, 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 a thinking process up here and that little voice gets activated and now it's the story that you tell yourself. It's the story that keeps you, yourself locked in anxiety. I had a young lady who, uh, who very successful. I wish I could have, I didn't. She called me up. I've worked with her for the for coaching for the last uh, two weeks. She, was, uh, she had not flown in forever. And no, she had never flown. That's it. 20 years old. And she had agreed to go with her sister and, and some other family members from Indianapolis to Florida. And, uh, and she, even up until, you know, we, we did all the work and, and she worked with the harmonizer every day, day in, day out. And during, and during the day, we're working on her anxiety. And I said, the one thing that's hardest to remember is as you get closer, your anxiety is not going to disappear. It's going to pop up. And in fact, the more, the more serious you get about overcoming your fear of flying, the more likely, the greater the likelihood that your anxiety will crop up because it realizes you're serious and it says, uh-uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stay here to protect you like I was designed. In any case, she calls me from the airport on, on uh, Friday, uh, getting ready to board. And, and, and she was sitting there or standing there and she said, I'm, oh, Ron, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm really nervous and all that. I said, what have we talked about? And I said, what are you doing now? She says, nothing. And I said, that's the trap is you, you do all this work using the harmonizer. And then when you get close to that, the, the feelings and your old behavior takes effect and you start ruminating again. So I said, what did you do? What, did, what have, we, have we done this week for you to, to, to get over this? And she said, listen to the harmonizer. Great. Put it on and listen to it. Talk to your, uh, we, I did a little coaching with, with the people that were going with her, telling her how they could support her. I said, do all of those and more. And don't take that harmonizer off until you land at the other end or you get sick and tired of listening to my voice, whichever comes first, because that's the thing. And that's the real success. And I wish I could have had recorded. She called me when they landed. Oh, Captain Rod, you're so wonderful. I love you. Yeah, yeah. And I and I remind her, thank you for that re re reaffirmation. But it's you that did the work. And it's like she was was not afraid before. So maybe I'll we'll have Ron as a guest here coming up in the in the uh, next couple of uh, weeks here. Okay. And last thing we, we talked, there are two kinds of triggers there. Okay, I'd like to take a quick shout out again for the Fearless Flight Kit. If you haven't got this, if you take a look at this link here at the bottom, you can get a, you can get a bonus of the harmonizer and, and what the kit's all about. So make sure you do that. Uh, that's the next slide, I think. Uh, yeah, I already had it up while you were speaking. Oh, okay, cool. And, um, and so we wanna make sure that, that uh, you have access to that. If, if, I, if, if you had nothing else that you were prepared to do or could do, the harmonizers, the, the fearless flight kit is, would be my recommendation. Okay, all right. Uh, next week, we're gonna come back and we're gonna do chapter four, which is about anticipatory anxiety. That is, that is one of the most popular questions we get. What do I do about anticipatory anxiety? We'll tell you some secrets about that and, and some things hopefully that, that will help you provide some insight with that. Uh, grab the next slide out of uh, off of the the thing just for anybody out there that that might be a Simpsons fan. I saw you know I get I get Google alerts about what's hot in the news and they tagged this one. If you're flying, they said uh, 
uh, Ro or Marge Simpson had, had, uh, there was a continuity error in the in the the shows apparently because on one show they had her flying from somewhere with the family and then at some point down the road they said she pointed out she was afraid to fly so I just speculated that perhaps Rose was faking it you know and, and or she was ashamed about him about letting it go and she guts her way through it but then it got got to her and she didn't know about fearless flight so she couldn't get any help so uh for those of you I mean, you can identify with marge simpson among others there and the last thing we want to do because we talk about accidents that are in the news this was a helicopter accident i think we're i think we're coming up on the anniversary or just past it and but the the reason it's in the news uh today and i believe yeah today i think uh, was because of the fact that uh, the National Transportation Safety Board, who's charged with the responsibility of, of uh, finding the causes to accidents, came out with their findings there. And Eric, I think if he's still with us, we'll ask him to come in here. Yeah. You can talk Just, about some of the technical things. I'm here, and, but I'm here has my video off. off. Ah, it's good. Now you're going to have to turn it on yourself. <laughs> yeah. We'll and me. you're here. Excellent. That's me. Okay, you got two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. That's what do we need to know? Hi, everybody. Um, do they need uh, to worry about dying in a helicopter crash? No. And the okay. reason this is big news is because it rarely, rarely happens. And because Kobe Bryant was a really famous guy. So that makes for really big news. Uh, the NTSB issued a fairly accurate report. We talked about it a year ago. The pilot was... Um, very well trained. Uh, in fact, he was an instrument rated helicopter pilot, which is not easy, and an instructor. The company that he flew helicopters for um, has what's called a set of operations specifications, which are like federal aviation regulations, not allowing them to operate helicopters in instrument weather on charters. So he had some pressure to comply with rules preventing him from using all his skills. And he was in very, very low weather, trying to navigate visually in appallingly low visibility. And it's it very tough to see. Generally, when you're doing that, that kind of clearance, you're using a radio navigate to navigate, and you're just looking out the window to separate from traffic. When the visibility is half a mile to a mile, and you're trying to see landmarks and navigate that way, it's extremely difficult. But both Ron and Dieter will talk about um, a little bit of uh, performance pressure, a little bit of personal personal pride kind of thing. Uh, the pilot was well known to Kobe and his family. He flew him all the time. I'm sure he felt tremendous desire to uh, complete the mission, um, even though he was doing this under visual flight rules in extremely low weather. That was under oh. two minutes. Yeah, cool. So, so the, 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 the takeaway from this is we wanted to review the process with you. So accidents do happen. And, and I've shared with you before, when they happen, two thirds to three quarters of the time, it's related to human factors. And that's, that's the number one causal factor here. They could have, they, and, and the second thing that comes out of it, as I mentioned in other accidents, is, is the first thing the National Transportation Board came out with is not only the cause of this accident, but other related issues that, may, that weren't even causal in this one that would help others operator, other helicopter operators in this case, prevent accidents of a similar fashion there. They, and they came out with, number one was training. They faulted the, the, the training, uh, not keeping the pilot as, uh, as attuned on how, what to do in situations like this, as he could have been, very similar. And the one thing that they didn't have that we have, that you'll have in the benefit, or it, that benefits all of the pilots that you'll be riding with, is the fact that it's highly regulated and, and demands strict compliance. You, you have to do regular training. Uh, uh, we, Eric and I had to go through at least twice every year and uh, demonstrate our proficiency and also look at items in the news like accidents that may have had something relevant that, that the NTSB and the FAA then, then decided that needed to be disseminated through our training network. So uh, well, what I think what shrouded this incident a bit in mystery is because in, on the pilot's you know, kind of account, there wasn't a lack of training per se. It was, you know, there were other factors, I think, that, that you describe as human factors, psychological factors that may have really impacted the decision-making process that 
you know, when somebody is really, truly, you know, activated, I think Ron, you mentioned that one time that um, different cultures, you know, depending on whether or not the pilot or the first officer is taking off and why they changed this because in different cultures, speaking to a superior in a certain way, you know, is not, yeah. is not even, you know, something that you should be doing. Yeah, it's called power differential. Yeah, and exactly. in this case, in this case, and in many cases, we, we have what's called self-induced pressure because mm -hmm. pilots are highly dedicated to, to completeting the mission. So mm -hmm. having said that, <laughs> Seven you got more one seconds. second. Seven. Because we decided tonight before when you before you got here that Seven. we are ending on time and we are at the end of the time. So we're going to do a quick review. So what did we talk about tonight? We talked about the fact that you can't control circumstances, but you can control your re reaction to that. We talked about triggers and how they impact you. We talked about, we reviewed what happens when people, when pilots make mistakes and we have accidents and how we, it, we that's how we got our record in aviation. And you get the last word, Eric, and you get to say goodbye to everyone. <laughs> Helicopter charter operators, like the one that uh, Kobe Bryant chartered from, operate under a different set of aviation regulations than the airlines. There's slightly less restrictive and they're they're written differently it's a different set of rules okay goodbye everyone <laughs> say good night okay it's it's the old laughing say good night eric say good night eric good okay night, eric. good night to everybody out there and next week hopefully we have the whole compliment crew here and so from captain ron and the rest of the crew have a great week happy landings good night everybody